Hello, welcome to Literary Life, and welcome to our first video of Chapter Chats for American Predator by Maureen Callahan. I am really excited to start this book. Um, so essentially, American Predator is about a serial killer um, who was active for over 14 years before he was arrested in 2012. And it's amazing to me that I have not heard of him, nor I'm guessing a lot of you, I don't know, let me know below if you've heard of him, but his name is Israel Keys, um, and he committed a series of rapes and murders, arson, um, burglary, um, before he was captured. So when this investigative journalist, Maureen Callahan, heard of um, his crime spree and how long he was able to go get away with it, um, she started to pull together this story because I supposedly the FBI has referred to Israel Keys as like unprecedented. Um, what blew my mind when I read the cover of this book was that this man buried kill kits all over the country um, and then went to them, committed his crimes and returned home to Alaska. That piece right there, that level of planning and effort it gives me goosebumps like even right now I got it again because somebody that is that intelligent and has that <laughs> strong solid planning skills um, and would go on and take on a predator role um, is really unsettling right um, so let's get started but before we do if you're not familiar with chapter chats essentially I go into a lot of detail as I'm reading the book about what's happening um, so if you don't want the book spoiled, stop now, wait until you've read the book and proceed because this is spoilers galore. Um, but this is an opportunity for you to read along and for us to comment and share our thoughts and experiences as we're reading the book below. Um, and lastly, before I get started, um, if you are not currently a subscriber, join us for 2020. It'll be awesome. We're going to have lots of um, conversations around books and um, book subscriptions and anything bookish really at all will be ahead of us. Um, but let's go read. Okay, so I can say right off the bat that I love this author's writing because she does a really good job, in my opinion, of, of course in my opinion, <laughs> but she does a really good job of bringing in the facts, but yet making it so engaging um, that I'm having no trouble staying focused and reading on the story. So it's just a fun read, especially at the end of the workday. Sometimes with nonfiction, I have a hard time depending on the language that's being used. So that being said, let's get started on what's happening. So we're in February of 2012 and we're starting with the kidnapping or the missing case of a girl by the name of Samantha Koenig. Um, so she is, I believe, a high school senior. Um, and she worked in a coffee kiosk in Alaska in Anchorage. And essentially these coffee kiosks are like these little huts at the side of the road. I, I'm not familiar with them. Um, and in fact, the snow is so high, it makes reference to the fact that the, the snow pile from, I guess, the shoveling, it, you can almost like not, all you can see is the roof of the kiosk from the road. Um, but essentially she had gone to her job there and um, didn't, and then disappeared at some point during the course of her shift. Um, so she, the girls, I guess, do work alone in these coffee kiosk huts. Um, so Samantha has two people in her life at the point of time when this occurred. And one is her boyfriend, Dwayne, and the other is her father, James. Um, there's no mention of her mother. And when the police initially are looking into the case in um, the Anchorage Police Department, um, they find that Samantha overall was well liked by all. She did have some history of um, drug use, and uh, she was, but she was very popular. Maybe cut class once in a while, but there's nothing for them. They're kind of on the fence between was she kidnapped um, or did she leave, take off, and just kind of go. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty um, when she first disappears. So we've met a couple of the um, police officers that I want to introduce you to. And one is um, Detective Dow. And she's new to this team, this department at the Anchorage Police Department. But she herself um, has is like a third generation police officer. And the case is this case of Samantha's disappearance is given, assigned to her. 
we also have a special agent from the f b i who is detective pain who gets brought into this case and essentially how that unfolded is he had a friend at the anchorage police department they just reached out to him because of some of the circumstances surrounding this case and i guess the communication back and forth out in anchorage is very common between the police department and f b i um, so it wasn't like alarming, like a new, unusual per se, the point being that the police officer reached out to Special Agent Payne. Um, but essentially what's bothering them is the fact that they have this 18 year old who was working her job um, and had asked her father to come by and bring her dinner and he, he did not do that. Um, but it didn't make sense to them. There were some indications like why would she have asked for dinner if she planned on taking off. Um, some of the other things though that came out as the police were looking at this case was that she had had an argument with her boyfriend via text and made the comment that she was just gonna go for a few days um, and be back later kind of thing. And they, you know, given her age, and I guess it's very common in Alaska for 18-year-olds um, to, to just kind of take off and go. Um, so the police, don't. The key point is that the police do not initially, when the disappearance happens, um, package it, think of it as a, a kidnapping. Um, so unfortunately what happens when Samantha went missing is that the kiosk was not shut down and kept as a crime scene. It was actually opened up for business the next morning. Um, so not only did we have someone come into the kiosk to work and serve the coffee, but the customers coming and going also occurred. Um, so in a sense, the crime scene initially was um, exposed. So Detective or Special Agent Payne offers to assist the police department and they initially say, no, Dow, Detective Dow says, we're good, we have enough. Um, but then Detective Dow calls, calls him back up a day later and says, okay, something's changed. And essentially what that was is a video. And within the video, you can see that Samantha's working the kiosk and then all of a sudden she turns the lights off. And when she turns the lights off, a tall shadowed figure appears and it appears that he could be holding a gun pointed at her. Um, and then there's over the next several minutes, it's like seven minutes, um, that figure is slowly approaches her, is giving her instructions, she kneels down, and then eventually the figure jumps over the serving area into the kiosk. Once in the kiosk, it's you have limited visibility to what's going on, but what's crazy is that he is in there for another 10 minutes with her. And then you see them stand up and they leave together. Um, at one point it does appear that her hands are tied, but essentially the police are looking at this video and it's a circumstance where A, given the time, the fact that he was from start to finish seven minutes and then in the kiosk around 10, so you have about 17 minutes remi reminding you that this kiosk is on a main road and I believe there was a parking lot behind it. So the fact that he could take this time if, he, if it was a kidnapping is really odd, right? Because they're in public essentially. And um, so that was the first factor. And then just from what they are able to see, the body language and everything, it's odd, but it can still go either way. Did she know this person and they talked and then willingly left together? The other thing that happened is he does have her rifle through and take some of the cash that's in the register. Um, so it could have been a thing of, yeah, we're gonna go, let's just grab this you know, cash and, and go off and do have fun for a couple days kind of thing. Um, so the video does call a lot of things into question. By the time this is, I think we're going on two days since Samantha's disappeared. So the police did interview Dwayne, um, Samantha's boyfriend, and James, her father, within a few hours of her disappearance. And it was kind of an odd conversation. Um, so Dwayne basically, initially he's telling them everything was fine between them. But he, they were looking at a text from her and the police officer kept asking him to scroll back, scroll further back in that conversation. And she sees that there is a fight that unfolded between Dwayne and Samantha. And essentially um, she told him to screw off and that she was gonna go stay with friends for a couple of days. It sounds like Dwayne lives at the home with um, Samantha and her dad, James. And so then Dwayne mentions that he, come, he came up to the kiosk where Samantha worked and he saw that stuff was kind of 
messy, like there were napkins strewn about, and um, that's not like Samantha. And even the, the girl who came to work the next shift in the morning um, made that comment as well, that um, the condition of the hut and the fact that it was unlocked, unsecured, was very unusual, that Samantha never did that. Um, so Dwayne said, you know, he saw this, he saw that she wasn't there, um, but he didn't try to enter because he was afraid of, um, that the hut was closed and he would be charged with, um, like a B and E. And, uh, so he just turned around and went back home and decided to wait for her. And of course she never came home. This is where it gets really odd though. He says at some point that he just suddenly got the urge, the feeling to get up and go outside and his and Samantha's truck is out there and that Samantha's driver's license was kept up in the visor of their truck. Um, he had driven Samantha to work, so he had their, I guess, shared truck. He said a masked man was rifling around and that they both stopped and stared at each other. And then the man walked away and he just went back in the house. So on top of that, <laughs> as if that isn't just an odd thing um, as well. Uh, the police are kind of like, why at this point, you know, Samantha's gone, this weirdo's rifling around the truck. And what, why didn't they call the police? And both Dwayne and James said it was because she hadn't been missing it for 24 hours. The other really odd thing is when the police came to the house, because Samantha's a missing person, she lived there to like check things out, they wouldn't let him in. And when they, when James came out to talk to the police, he kept the door like closed and wedged himself out and then went back in the same way. So very much acting in and not very open, right? Very secretive manner. So it's like, it, I, I can see where this grade, the circumstances and how the police were, you know, is this a kidnapping? Is this a, the family do something? I, it's, it would be very confusing. So we have three investigators at this point that are involved. Um, Anchorage Police Department, we have Detective Dahl, who I've talked about, and then another one that came into play, Detective Bell. And then we have the FBI Special Agent Payne. Um, so what has happened is they brought in informants at this point to gather some additional information, and they're getting information like all over the board. So they're hearing that James, the father, may have upset either Hell's Angels or the Russian Mafia, and they've kidnapped um, Samantha because of that. They're hearing that Samantha was dealing drugs, that she was stealing from suppliers, or she'd been bragging about stealing from suppliers, and that that's why she was kidnapped. So they're getting um, all kinds of info that may or may not be panning out. And each of their three investigators have a different take on the situation at this point. One, um, Detective Bell feels that Samantha has done this whole thing. It's like a stunt for attention. Um, Detective Dowell feels that James, the father, is involved in Samantha's disappearance and perhaps murder. And um, Special Agent Payne um, believes that Samantha's been kidnapped. So at this point, um, the father, James, has been very active. He's set up a shop outside the coffee kiosk with a big um, poster of his daughter who's missing. He's created a Facebook page. He set up a reward for information about where she's at. And it, some people's opinion, the father has done much more than the police department in um, drawing attention to and getting information around what's gone on with Samantha. Okay, so about three weeks after Samantha went missing, um, her boyfriend, Dwayne, gets a text that is essentially a ransom demand. Um, and things, if it's even possible for them to get scurrier, get scurrier. And um, at this point, it's been over three weeks, but it says Connor Park sign under pick of Albert Ain't She Purdy. Um, totally misspelled. And so Dwayne and James rush over there and essentially there's a bulletin board that's got like flyers up on it, but there's a Ziploc bag containing a rambling ransom note and a whole bunch of, or several black and white um, Xerox Polaroids of Samantha. And in one picture, she's got duct tape across her mouth. And in another one that's really odd, um, her hair's braided, she's got eyeliner on, she's looking at the camera. But a man's muscled arm is like holding her head up. I'm not quite sure how, but it said it, her head's being held up. 
so, and what's interesting is that her hair was down um, at the time she was kidnapped. So, um, essentially at this point, uh, we have proof of life. The kidnapper in this ransom note that was typed um, is demanding $30,000 deposited in Dwayne and Samantha's uh, account, bank account. Apparently the killer has Samantha's debit card. Um, as well as her phone because he used it to text uh, text Dwayne's phone. Um, so up until this point, the police had been trying to ping her phone, and the dad was calling it over and over, and it was going right into it. It went from ringing to voicemail to eventually going straight into voicemail. It had been turned off. So now it officially becomes an FBI case, and um, the killer also the kidnapper at this point. We shouldn't say killer. The kidnapper um, at this point also uh, made the commentary that they had left Alaska and were down in the States and um, that she had almost escaped twice um, and he must be losing his skill, essentially. So there's some discussion over whether or not Samantha's alive or dead in the photos um, by the staff uh, or the investigators. They brought in um, an expert in snuff films as well um, who looked at the photos and actually been, couldn't tell. Um, so that's, uh, the, the photos must have had an odd quality to them, I'm guessing, um, for that to have even come to mind. Um, the other thing that was kind of interesting is that within themselves, before they talked to James, there's a, um, a, lot, of dis a lot of discussion around what they should do. Some Somebody broached they should shut the car down, deposit the money, and then um, have James text that he wants the face-to-face -face exchange kind of thing to try to lure this person out. And Payne feels like this is a really bad idea. This is back in 2012, and I honestly don't <laughs> 2012 feels like yesterday to me. So trying to think about, okay, where was technology at at this point? I'm trying to remind myself. Um, but the idea being that uh, this is our one connection to this person. And this person is obviously smart to have pulled off this crime the way they did. The misspellings in the letter pain feels are sort of a diversion where they're trying to come across as less than they are. But he keeps going back to the fact that this is a very skillful individual. And his argument is that they should keep the card active so that they can track the person when they use this card. And supposedly the card was used a couple of times on the night of um, her kidnapping, but it doesn't go into a lot of detail around that. So essentially, Bell agrees, um, Detective Bell agrees with Payne. Detective Dowell has a slightly different take. She still feels that this is very much drug related and that um, James is really suspect due to his behavior and his background. She still feels that this has something to do with his trying to get his hands on more money. Um, and, you know, there's the comment that, you know, uh, Detective Dow is new to this role. She's a rookie to this type of investigation, but she has worked undercover and she has worked um, on, for uh, in drug crimes. So is that why her brain's going here? Because that's the type of um, situation she's used to having to essentially analyze and solve. Um, or is she onto something? So essentially at this point, they agree with Payne's plan, which is we're going to deposit the money and track the card. Um, and they approach James, the father. So what's really in, 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 even more interesting, I feel like I'm saying that a lot, but um, so James doesn't want to pass the money to doesn't want to put it on the card, which seems off, right? Because his whole thing at this point, he had set up a PayPal account. He um, was asking for donations to help with the rescue efforts and reward money from like the first 48 hours of Samantha's having gone missing. And he has collected a sizable amount of reward funds. And um, the fact that he now has the opportunity to use, um, he's offering 70 as a reward. So this 30 that's being asked for is nowhere near, he's got it, essentially. He's received it, reward money. So it's kind of funny that he doesn't want to use it at this point. Um, the other thing that's brought up about him that's kind of sketchy is that uh, essentially a family friend or family member had notified the the police or um, pain and had basically said something was just off with James because he was like obsessed 
with the reward account, pretty much logging into it multiple times a day just to see where the balance stood. Um, and he had also been using some of that money for personal reasons, and he acknowledged it, that he had used some of it to maintain his living, daily living expenses. Um, so the genuineness of his involvement and what that money was for is definitely um, not adding up. The other thing, you know, remember I mentioned how when the police had come by and dropped by his house to talk to him, he wouldn't let him in and he did the closed door, came out well. Essentially, the man was growing a whole bunch of the pot <laughs> in his house um, and that is the reason why. So definitely confirmed he's, in, he's involved, um, at least in the pot industry. Uh, at this point, we know, but um, also, you know, whether or not he actually owes people money, Samantha did, it's still a lot of speculation and rumor going on with that. Um, but he has the opportunity to um, use 30000 to follow up on this lead and does not want to, does not want to do that. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, so James, the dad, contacts the police department and says that he is going to deposit $5,000 into the account. He says that the FBI told him to do this because it would frustrate the individual and cause them perhaps to make a mistake or to act. Um, and it, the book doesn't confirm if the FBI did in fact give that instruction or not. But so the $5,000 is deposited. Now, what is interesting is this is Dwayne, the boyfriend, and Samantha's bank account. Um, I had made the reference to the fact that the night that Samantha was kidnapped, there were, there were um, two activities, and those were attempted withdrawals. But Dwayne and Samantha had like less than $5 in that bank account. So they were denied. They failed. So now $5,000 is deposited into that account. And almost instantly, there is an attempted withdrawal of $600. Now the account has a daily limit withdrawal of 500, so that account is denied. Shortly thereafter, from another ATM, um, $500 is withdrawn and is successful. So immediately, the police are watching this and nobody has announced, nobody else knows that that money was put in. So the fact that the withdrawals happened at that point in time, and by somebody who is not familiar with ATM regulations, that would not have considered that there is a limit and that, that it was at $500. So to them, this points back to James, which I find confusing because I'm like, if you have the money, why would he be withdrawing this money? But they felt it pointed potentially was another indication um, that it could be James because he, if he has a cash business, um, he would not be familiar with like ATM debit card restrictions, regulations, that kind of thing. Um, so, and if, at this point, Bell is kind of feeling like Detective Bell is starting to now swing to perhaps agree with Detective Dow on the fact that James may be more involved with this than they thought. Um, but what is the other thing that happens? So they get the footage from these attempted withdrawals. And that does take like a day or two for them to get. The footage, the footage quality is horrible. Um, so we have an FBI agent um, by the name of Iber who is sent the files of this video to basically see what he can get from them. So meanwhile, the other thing that is interesting that comes out in this chapter um, is that the police department did not request footage from a local camera near the ki the kiosk from which Samantha was kidnapped for three weeks after her kidnapping. And then once they made the request to the Home Depot, um, it took Home Depot two days to release the footage. So there were a number of hiccups, it sounds like, in the investigation. And I mentioned before, one is that they didn't, like, make it a crime scene the morning after it was discovered that or reported once it was reported that Samantha was um, missing and essentially shut down that kiosk. It was left open for business. The next employees were in and out as were customers, right? So that was issue one. Issue, there were other small issues, but in my mind, the next biggest issue I now know of is the fact that they had footage. So across the street from the coffee kiosk is a Home Depot that had the camera of its parking lot. And they didn't request that footage for three weeks. Um, so once that footage is received, essentially what do they see on it? They see a man pull up in a white pickup truck. 
and apparently white pickup trucks, it says are very common in Anchorage. Um, so a man pulls up and he sits there for a while. And then you see him leave his pickup truck and he walks across the street and about 20 minutes elapses and we know what went on um, kind of during that time. And then you see him coming back with his arm around Samantha. And what's really bizarre is there's activity. And at one point when a traffic light changes, you see Samantha bolt. And at that point you can tell her hands are tied. And he goes after her and tackles her. And he whispers something to her and we don't know what it is. But the other crazy part is that next to his truck, there is another car near it in the Home Depot where a few people are lingering. And they walk up to the pickup truck and Payne, the special agent Payne at this point in his head is, you know, basically thinking to her, you know, yell for help, don't get in that pickup truck. And whatever the guy had whispered to her must have, was effective because she doesn't do anything. She stands there with him and the people get in their car and go and then he gets her into the passenger side of the pickup truck and they drive away and it's just crazy because to think about the fact that she was essentially kidnapped like and people were there people were around and she tried to escape and nobody saw this i mean it, it that part is blowing my mind so meanwhile the fbi agent iber who is looking at the footage from the atm withdraws um, essentially is able to identify a few, a few things. Um, the, there is a, a jacket that's being worn that says corpse. He believes um, that this person is in the military, Marines, or was. Um, and yeah, had been a Marine. Uh, the man was wearing clear or light colored eyeglasses, a gray face mask, gray gloves, dark pants, and lighter white shoes. Um, that is unfortunately all he was able to identify, which is actually remarkable considering the low quality of the, um, of the footage he's received. Okay, for those reading along, currently on Chapter 5, but one of the things that I did not highlight was the fact that, or at least I don't think I did, was the fact that the ATM usage currently was in Anchorage, and it was actually two successful withdrawals made after the one failed attempt where the person tried to pull 600 over the limit, and the two successful withdrawals were made pretty much back to back. I think it was like around 20 minutes at two separate locations, but the timing of it indicated that there was intentional driving from one location to the other, and this told Payne that this person knew Anchorage. All right, so now when we go into chapter five, we actually have unexpected ATM usage starting the chapter, and it's down in Arizona. So we are now in the, what is it, the lower, lower states, and essentially, um, so they're alerted, and Payne knows an agent, a field agent down in that area, so he can reach out to that person, the field agent goes, and they get the footage, but it's still going to take a day or two outside of some, like, email snapshots of the footage to actually get the footage up to Alaska and then get it over to the lab for a review. Meanwhile, they get another hit on the ATM, ATM a withdrawal. This one is denied, um, and it's in New Mexico. So what's interesting about it is a timestamp, because the reason for the denial is that because of the hour change um, in time, the suspect being from Alaska probably did not was not familiar with the time zones and did not realize that they were considered within the same, I guess, um, 24 hour or bank cycle period so that the second charge was denied. So further down the I-10 corridor, the suspect makes another attempt for $80 this time, which is successful after doing a balance inquiry and seeing that there is like over three grand in the account. I think it's almost four grand still at this point. Um, so now a pain is relieved because one of the things I didn't talk about is he he's really a everyone's exhausted I think it's a month into the investigation and people have been working around the clock um, but there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of disagreement between detectives Bell and Dahl and um, special agent Payne and what was going on where the evidence was leading how to collect the evidence what proper policy is uh, so 
this had been going on and he had been struggling himself, I guess, with, is he doing the right thing? Is he approaching this correctly? And now the fact that the ATM card is giving them activity and it's working um, is, is a good sign because now they're, they at least have a location. Um, but what, what is interesting though, one of the things that about the bank Western was too small to have a centralized database for pulling videos and financials. I, that barely means anything to me, um, but apparently this was a critical piece and the suspect pulled from a Western bank again down the road. He must have known enough about this. Again, there was something smart and in ways in which he could get to the cash in a manner with a, using a resource that was less least helpful to the police and FBI. Um, so it slows them down, basically. So again, another indication that we have somebody with a lot of research, planning, knowledge. Okay, so the suspect is moving along the I-10 corridor and transfers on to 59 and is in Texas. And there are a number of withdrawals now at ATMs that are being made. But what's interesting is he's sticking with smaller banks um, throughout all of those ATM withdrawals. And the two roads he's traveled thus far have been major highways. And what's interesting from the footage at the ATM machine, they're now able to see that he is driving a small white vehicle. And our FBI agent, um, I believe it was Iger, does a windshield analysis on the video <laughs> and determines that it is a white Ford Focus. So what's really fun at this point is that the um, FBI agent, we get introduced to a Texas, um, the Texas Rangers. And the one Texas Ranger in particular, Rayburn, is assigned to assist the FBI. And he receives um, the photos, the information, and essentially, and it's passed along to the um, road patrol in Texas. And he knows the roads very well because before he was a ranger, he worked for years in the area patrolling. And um, so he recognizes the fact that they're, they're essentially looking for a needle in a haystack. There's some challenges here. And there's another Texas ranger with the last name, I think Henry, I think it's a last name, not a first name. But what's really funny is when they they look at these horrible photos and they're told it's a white Ford Focus, um, Ranger Henry, who's very thorough, um, goes to a local Ford dealership. He's like, how do they know this is a Ford Focus? And sure enough, when they go there, they confirm it is. So the windshield analysis done by um, Iver is solid. I thought that was awesome. But anyway, um, so now we have the Rangers um, that are looking for another very common, a white Ford Focus in the States, I guess, is one of like the top rented cars back in 2012. So again, our suspect is doing a very good job of blending in and making things very difficult for law enforcement. So essentially, every time they get a hit on the withdrawal, they're immediately re reaching out to the bank managers to get assistance on pulling that footage and getting it over to them. And FBI Special Agent Payne is a little disheartened because one of the phone calls to the bank manager in Humble, Texas, I think was the name of the town, that manager refuses, she refuses to go. She says, no, she will not go, nor will she have any of her employees go. Um, they will just have to wait for 9 a.m. And unfortunately, you know, even when he, um, Payne pleaded with her and said, you know, somebody's life could be at stake, it didn't sway this person. So boo, bank manager in humble Texas. Um, I, I don't know, was it like the middle of a crazy ice storm or a tornado where lives would have been in danger? I, I, I'm so curious, like wrapping my head around what is the rationale um, for that. But regardless, um, so they now have a vehicle and they've confirmed it. So the Henry Ranger basically decides that he can't just sit around. I'm, I may be inferring things here. But he goes and he starts driving around motels in the area along that corridor part of Texas to look for this white Ford Focus. And lo and behold, he actually finds one. I think it was outside of Super 8 in the parking lot with like the rental barcode in it. So at this point, they also have the assistance of, I think her last name is Ganaway from that local FBI field office. Um, 
and she's involved and they're looking at i got that name right i'm excited i got they're looking at uh inside the car they see white sneakers up front um there's like a knife uh some children's girls clothing um, so they're back and forth on the phone and they basically decide they're going to have Henry follow um, the person. They can see they're keeping the vehicle under surveillance. He, a man, um, white male, tall white male, I think they said at this point, coming out, putting stuff in the car, obviously getting ready to leave. Um, so they tell Henry to follow him and he needs a reason to pull him over. Um, so he can't just stop him they, based on suspicion at this point. So literally, he's following him, he's following him, this person's driving very well until finally the person goes two miles over the speed limit and Henry pulls him over. So when he pulls the man over and asks him where he's from, he says, Alaska. We're in Texas, right? So um, I'm kind of, at this point, like my heart is, I'm curious, like chapter six to me so far has been like, they're all kind of exciting, but it has been like really intense. And um, so they're they're talking to him about what, what the deal is. And at first he says he's in town for his sister's wedding and his brother rented a hotel room. He's been staying there for a couple of um, days or something like that. But then um, they ask him, well, how'd you, how'd you come down here? Did you fly or drive? And he's like, well, I flew into Vegas because I wanted to see my daughter and take her to see something. And then he drove from Vegas here for the sister's wedding. But where things really get sketchy, because at this point they, they're observing him, they feel like he's getting tense, he's showing signs of lying, and um, it, he's giving too many details. And they apparently feel that there's indication that he's um, something suspicious. Um, so uh, the FBI, FBI agent Gannaway calls FBI agent Payne up in Alaska and basically explains the situation. And, the biggest concern is if you take him in and you check the car and you, it's found that you did not have probable cause, any evidence uncovered, any part of the investigation that stems from that moment gets thrown out. I mean, that's a lot to gamble. And you can, you can hear it between the conversation as it's portrayed with Payne and Ganaway that there is that sense of, do we have enough? Do we have enough? Um, so they decide to go for it and Payne gets the call. The chapter ends with Ganaway basically, basically saying, we've got him. We've got enough information here. Um, and it is, uh, the name Israel Keys. Okay. So we have a list, chapter seven. I'm going to cover chapter sevens and eight, sevens, <laughs> chapter sevens and eight right now. Um, it's really interesting because they list out the things found in the car. And in case you're not reading along, I want to kind of share that with you because it's an interesting mix of items. So in the front passenger seat, they found an energy drink, school photos of a child. I don't think I mentioned this, but they, um, he said his daughter was around 10 years old. Um, a pair of the sneakers, white, that they believe he was wearing when he accessed the ATM. One ATM receipt, which was under the driver's side mat that said debit not available. A Sony digital camera with the photos of a wedding, over 200 photos of a wedding. One new gray shirt with store tags, um, amber tinted sunglasses, no package. A t-shirt with one sleeve cut off. I, I'm, I'm like racking my brain trying to think of like what is the purpose of that. So definitely if you guys have thoughts, put that below. Um, cause I totally feel like that's so suspicious, right? A dark gray fleece Columbia jacket, several Walmart bags and a roll of cash, but the denominations are five and $10. And this kind of stumps the police because from the ATM withdrawals, you always get twenties, right? So what is going on with all these small bills in the back seat, a Walmart receipt from Texas, um, a sandwich and energy drink, a pair of black sunglasses, partial gallon of water, laundry detergent, and one pink backpack. And then in the trunk, a green backpack, a gray DVD case containing pornographic images on um, a, both a black female and a transgender um, pornography. And then Alaska Airlines flight confirmation for himself and his daughter leaving Anchorage, going to Seattle, and then going to Las Vegas. 
and bottles of alcohol still chilled and a gray fleece jacket gray hooded sweatshirt a laptop a sam samsung cell phone but the battery and sim card are gone a toiletry kit a handgun a pair of binoculars a black ski mask and one headlamp so what's interesting though is when they get his wallet inside the wallet is both samantha's driver's license and the green ATM card with the, the pin code actually scratched into the front of it for that ATM card. So essentially they put him under arrest. They take him to the police department and they decide in, in the get-go to have um, Rayburn, who is the Texas Ranger, attempt the interview first because they were worried more so about how he would respond to a woman in authority. So the thought was, okay, let's put a man, he's the Texas Ranger, and see if they can build any sort of camaraderie and get any communication going. And Israel essentially just, no, shuts down, won't talk to him. So then the next day, both Bell and Dal have flown in, and they decide at this point, Dal, who is blonde from Alaska, they're going to now switch it up a little bit and have Dal approach him. So she does, and essentially um, his reply is simply to say that somebody slipped, um, I think it was the cell phone, the debit card, and the... Um, a uh, driver's license in a sandwich bag through a crack in his window that he leaves his truck window cracked uh, b due to smoking cigars um, and that he had come back and found that somebody had dropped the sandwich bag in and he assumed it was payment um, for monies that were owed to him for his construction business and they're like yeah that doesn't really make sense and he is like don't really care because basically at that point all they can get him on right is credit card fraud um, so the other part that was really interesting, meanwhile, when, before Bell and Dal flew down to Texas, um, they, once they identified that he was Israel Keys, they went out to his house. They find his license, I mean, his address. First of all, the man has zero record. Um, they do believe he is in the military, was in the military, so they're looking into that right now, um, as we're reading but no criminal record whatsoever, which is very unusual. Um, two, he lives in a home with his daughter and with his girlfriend, who is a nurse at a local hospital, and the neighborhood they live in is actually very nice, like full of doctors and lawyers, and they found this to be unusual. So when Bella went out to the house, because it, essentially at their mind, they're wondering, is Samantha being kept, and can they, is she alive, and can they get her and free, free her? Um, so he goes out to the house. Somebody had just left because uh, there's fresh tire tracks in the snow. Nobody's answering, but at this point they don't have the search warrant, so they can't enter the home. But outside of the home is the pickup truck that fits the description seen in the video um, of Samantha's kidnapping. It says Keys Construction on the side with a phone number. Um, he takes several photos of it, but there is like a lumber rack. I'm not sure what that is but there's a lumber rack on the back of the truck. And when he looks at, when Detective Bell looks at it closely, the, um, uh, uh, totally blanking on the, the washers. <laughs> Did you like the, um, it's like, <laughs> if you were playing charades with me, um, the washers are rusty and old, but the bolts themselves are brand new. So the thought is that he, um, he must have removed the lumber rack when he kidnapped Samantha and then quickly put it back on his truck after the fact. Um, so in, I guess, supposedly at some point, the Anchorage Police Department had looked at this, this truck at this address after Samantha was kidnapped and had cleared it. Um, so there's another like, ooh, moment there too as well. Um, so they, they realized though that, um, Keyes' girlfriend, the nurse, her name was Kimberly Anderson, um, is working at the hospital. And they reach out to the hospital and basically um, get her picked up so that they can talk to her. And she absolutely believes that Israel Keyes is innocent. And she says that the night of Samantha's kidnapping, that um, he was home, he came into the bedroom where she was a few times throughout the course of the night. The next morning, him and his, his daughter flew somewhere, I forget where, and then she caught up with them a few days later and then they went on a cruise. So she's basically saying there is no way 
he had the time to be able to have committed this crime. She believes he's completely innocent. Okay, so on top of that really quickly, um, when we're now back where uh, Detective Bell and Heidi Keys are, um, they see a woman standing in the building where they've been, I guess, I think it was interviewing Keys, who essentially, they said, style-wise, looks very Amish. She's wearing what looks to be a homemade dress, um, full-length cotton homemade dress. Her hair is in a very long braid. Um, and they find out that this is Israel Keys' mother. And when they approach her to see if she will talk to their son, that he potentially could have been involved with um, a girl, an 18-year-old girl's disappearance, um, the woman says, I can't help you. And they, they beg her. They literally say, I'm begging you. There's a girl out there whose father's frantic. And this, the woman's reply, her name is Heidi, was, well, if God wants that girl to be found, she'll be found. And that is the end of part one. So this video, we're also going to cover part two. So let's get rolling. So part two is basically where they're getting ready to extradite Israel Keys from Texas to Alaska. And that takes a couple of weeks. So in this time, they're just looking up his background. What has this guy been up to? Because what was surprising is they're not finding criminal activity. So he did live in Washington, this really small rural town for like two to three years when he was a teenager. Um, I think it was like 17 to 19, around that age range. And then he joined the military and he was in the military from 98 to 2000. And he actually successfully completed pre-rager training, uh, which is like a really notoriously tough, is it notorious? Anyway really tough really tough right and this guy made it through it and he was honorably discharged from the military what really kind of blows their mind though is they're learning a little bit more about him they look at the areas he's lived in is it just doesn't make sense because essentially he has not for somebody like him that seems to be intelligent um, successfully in the military and achieved more difficult things in the military, you would expect somebody like this to live somewhere in which they could um, be very active, a lot of adventure. And when they look at where he's lived geographically, it's always these um, very extremely rural, I think even impoverished to some extent, so limited resources, small towns. And that really surprises them. So they, they also spend some time with Israel's mom, Heidi, and she's very religious. And they essentially find out that at some point she lived in the northern states. I think it was like the out northeast. And um, her and her daughters essentially met and um, really fell into this re leadership, this religious. And it sounded to me almost more like cult-like. Um, very strict religion and moved down with the um, those and they I think it was all males moved down with them to Texas and essentially that is how they got involved with the current church um, she talks she does talk to them about Israel and it sounds like he's had kind of a bizarre history and way of engaging with the family because there were a couple of trips where he would come and then just disappear. And when they tried to communicate with him and he'd be gone for like a couple of days and they would get some really kind of bizarre texts where he would say, I'm here, I'm at this mall or I, I ran out of gas or something like that. And they would go, they actually went to one location to, to help him and he wasn't there. And instead of like coming back to the house, they like all slept in a parking lot in the vehicle waiting for him. So it, it's just odd. I mean, the, the way the, the decision making with the family is very off. Like it, I can't follow the logic a little bit. Um, and also his behavior. Um, when he finally returned on um, both of the these couple of incidents, he was disheveled. He seemed almost like a little hypomanic maybe i don't i can't make an official <laughs> but it just like where he his thinking was a little disorganized his speech was a little um faster than normal it's it felt like he was just a little bit more not himself and when you think about somebody that successfully completed you know ranger training um he should have it, it just it doesn't all add up 
So something is definitely, definitely off with this guy and something's been going on for a while. So what's really interesting is that the, you know, the FBI essentially went through and all this discussion and planning for how they're going to approach the interview with um, Israel Keys. And all of a sudden they hear from the U.S. Attorney's Office, prosecuting attorney in Alaska, that uh, there's a different plan and they essentially have to follow it. And it's that the, they're not, Israel's not going to be interviewed at the FBI's office. He's going to be interviewed at the prosecuting attorney's office and, or the U.S. Attorney's Office, and um, they're going to do the interview. And apparently, according to the way this is written in the book, this is not just extremely odd, but could also um, be uh, prosecutorial misconduct. Um, so I'm curious, because I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> may not have known that, but I am not a lawyer. <laughs> and I'm in marketing analytics. <laughs> I work in digital analytics. <laughs> um, so this is outside of my no zone. <laughs> I didn't know nothing about this. So I'm curious, like how odd, how unusual is that? So if anyone by chance is an attorney um, or in the law field, yeah, I would love just to hear, yeah, that's crazy, or eh, it does happen sometimes when politics or whatever. Um, so yeah, curious about that one. <laughs> so just from continuing to read, it does seem they give some more information on why this is the risk and why you just don't do things this way. And essentially it's because A, if there's any misconduct found, the whole case will get thrown out. And um, B, if um, he's technically becoming not just the prosecutor, but a witness by doing the interrogation. So the defense attorney can actually call him on the stand. And prosecutors cannot handle evidence at this stage. Um, it says it contaminates the chain of custody. So I'm so baffled. Like there are some very clear cut reasons why you don't do this. I wanna know what's up. It's 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 career building essentially. That this case is so huge in Alaska, and it's probably going to end up. I mean, it's already got national attention. Um, this is going to be something that would end up on Dateline kind of thing, and he wants to be forefront in it. And apparently, it's not enough to be the prosecuting attorney and get enough attention. He actually has to go beyond his job. Oh, wow. So they start the interview. And originally he says, it's so bizarre that he went there essentially to rob the place and walked around for, for a bit. Um, and it was closed and he left. And so I'm totally thinking, okay, so like he's, he's not going to come forward. Um, So interestingly enough, they ask him, they being Feldus, the prosecuting attorney, asks him if he would like to tell his story backward. Um, and so at this point, he does talk about, um, you know, he, he tries to find out what they found from an evidence perspective. And apparently <clears throat> an important technique is that you, you never fully disclose everything that you have um, and just the key things, but you certainly don't want to draw attention to what you don't have. So this is where they're all very nervous about how fell this is going to handle this because this takes practice and skill and it's critical because they have limited information um, that he not let on. They need to pretend they have more than they do. So it's really interesting because um, Feld is basically asks, so Keyes makes the assumption, he knows they got a search warrant for the house. So he's assuming that they've found stuff, evidence, because there's evidence. 
But what's crazy is he mentions, you probably found the um, plywood in my shed. And it's, some of it's in the shed, some of it's behind the shed, and that that plywood is what he uses for ice fishing. And Feldis doesn't really know the evidence so f well yet that's come through. Um, so he doesn't recall this, but the other investigators also don't remember there being anything uh, that Keyes is talking about, but they don't want to let on, right? So there's a lot of anxiety around, is Feldis going to blow this the whole time? So as they're talking, um, Keyes is talking about the fact that he, how he essentially put her body or recovered her body, I'm not clear on that yet, from a hole, like an ice fishing hole. So he essentially says that they're probably going to find something on it. So he assumes they have this, this tote and sled and the plywood and that they're going to find something on it. And what's really interesting is that the investigators don't know yet what he's talking about. And it crosses one of their minds, have they not found the shed that he's referring to? Because they did find a shed, but maybe there's another shed. So he keeps talking, and this is where it's, it is a little bit confusing because he's, there, he's starting at the end, so to speak, because they asked him to tell the story backward. And he basically tells them, you're probably going to find something on it. He doesn't say what, what, but he says how he had to use the sled because you can't park down by the lake. And he can only carry pole about 150 pounds at a time in the sled. So he had to make three trips. Um, so he says, you're going to need five different bags. And they're like, okay, can you tell us what you pulled out in each of those trips? And he says the first day was the head, legs, and the arms. And they ask him of Samantha Koenig, and he says, yep. So now we can hear it from the beginning. So Keyes is telling them what happened that night, and he, he knows that they have a video, and he essentially describes everything that they see and the, that we already knew about, that we see in the video. What's interesting, though, is he starts out like he's just going to rob the place, but once he got there and, um, you know, she he saw her and she was alone and he, he decided to bring her with him. Um, what we did not know from watching the video is that um, once he got her hands tied, he had taken the paper napkins and stuck them in her mouth. Um, so this is why she did not call out for help. Um, we also did not know that as they were walking, he spots a $300 camera on the ground. And when he bends down to pick it up, um, she takes off running and that's when he tackles her. Well, it's interesting because he took this as a sign, like an omen that he's doing the right thing. Um, and the fact that she had a failed escape attempt actually ended up working in his favor because when they then crossed the street, they crossed the Home Depot parking lot and went to his truck, which was actually parked in an IHOP parking lot. Um, the people that were near him, they were parked at the end of his truck, were getting in the car to leave, and he essentially whispered to her um, to pretend like she was drunk, you know, stumbling around, lean on him, um, but just to watch what she's doing because he had the 22 pointed at her and he would kill her, um, and it would be quiet. He's got quiet bullets, so these people may not even, like, know that he shot her, I guess was the inference. Um, and so that is why she did not try to escape. So Keyes essentially told her that he was um, taking her for ransom. And she said, you know, my family doesn't have anything. And he was like, it doesn't matter. They always are able to come up with money. Um, so that, you know, I, and I don't know if that's what she was weighing, assuming that that was the case. But um, they get stopped at a traffic light and a cop car pulls up next to him. And at this point, he's considering, you know, what are his options if she flips out? He assumes she will because, you know, in his mind, why wouldn't she? And um, she chooses not to. And he decides just to keep it cool um, and sit at the light. And then the light turns green and the cop car takes off. So he basically drives to a park. So while at the park, when they pull up, they are approached by a group of people, cross-country skiers, who are coming back. And 
they're essentially able to sit there in the truck while the cross country skiers load up their stuff and leave. So again, yet another moment where Samantha um, had an opportunity to escape and survive and um, it did not happen. So essentially he clears out the back seat of his truck and puts down a tarp and that's where he puts Samantha. He gets her wrapped up or under a tarp fully zip tied um, to the seatbelt so that she's completely now physically restrained. And then he realizes to do the ransom demand, he needs a burner phone. Um, and he th considers like where he can go, he could go to Walmart, but then he he, he knows that Walmart apparently has some of the best security cameras out in the parking lot than anyone. <laughs> so he vetoes that plan. And, but what this cues to the detectives is that he's experienced. I mean, this, his way of thinking and his decision makings, um, are a symptom of practice. So they're thinking this guy's probably done this before. So he decides he can actually go back to the kiosk, the coffee kiosk, and use Samantha's phone, that that'll do the job he needs. So he goes back to the kiosk, and when he leaves Samantha thoroughly tied to the inside of the truck, he basically tells her, don't even try to escape. I'll be able to tell when I come back, and I'll hurt you. And apparently this type of threat is significant because you're not saying I'll kill you. You're giving the victim hope. So I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to hurt you. So if you comply with me, you, you have the chance of getting out of this alive. And that is actually something that's, um, they've learned about at Quantico. So again, they're getting they're as he's talking, they're seeing his thought process and his training come through. So here's the key. They say victims often believe fatally that they'll be let go. So we look for those signs as a victim, we hold on to those signs, and that can very well what, what leads us down the path of our own ruin. Wow, so he actually, he goes back to the kiosk and he realizes, um, to get her phone, and he realizes he had left some of his zip ties there. So he snags those and he decides to go ahead and clean up a little bit. Um, so he straightens up the kiosk, he leaves again, and as he's walking back to the truck, he realizes he didn't grab her car keys. So he goes back again and grabs her car keys. Here's the kicker about it. If the investigators had watched the surveillance video, I believe it's the Home Depot surveillance video, the full way through, they would have seen these returns and apparently at this point in time they had not watched it so they didn't even know that he came back to the kiosk. So at this point Keys and her go to a place called Earthquake Park because she says she has to um, use the bathroom when they leave the kiosk that she worked at. Um, and there's people at this park and it, by count according to Keys story. This is actually the sixth time in the course of him going after Samantha that they've had potential witnesses. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the first time is when he was watching her work at the kiosk. There was, and I think it was originally approaching her, um, there was somebody parked um, off to the side and sitting there for a little while that caught Key's attention and was suspicious. Honestly, it's weird. Like, I don't know if it was another, like, was it somebody that was sort of watching? I don't know. It's just strange. Um, but we had that individual. Then when he had removed her, there were passers-by as they were going um, from the kiosk to his vehicle. There were the people that were getting into their vehicle that were parked near his truck when he took her. There was the cop at the traffic light um, there were, oh, the skiers at the first park, and now we're at another park and there are more people. Um, at this, so what he does is he removes the zip ties, gets her out of the back, puts a rope around the neck and walks her out, um, and lets her go to the bathroom. And he, d he smokes cigars and he lights up a cigar and actually says he shared it with her. Um, while well, they stood out there for a little bit. And at this point she is according to him, talking to him, like trying to engage with him. And the detectives are impressed. She was being very smart um, and trying to make that connection. Um, so he takes her at this point and they finally go back to his home. And while he leaves her in the tarp tied up, um, 
he starts to reinstall that rack we had mentioned before in his truck, which is making a lot of noise. And what's interesting about it is it's midnight. He's going on 1 a.m., I think. None of the neighbors, his girlfriend's asleep in the house. None of the neighbors are um, suspicious. And because it's, he said, because it's Alaska, like people are just out doing things, which, you know, again, I think it's great that uh, people are so accepting of each other. But in this case, it's really unfortunate because this was suspicious and something was going on and it would have been great if uh, she could have been saved. Keys also used her phone at this point in time and says he returned texts to several people. Her boyfriend, I think a friend, her dad, and he did them in such a way that he wanted to sound pissed um, so that Samantha was, uh, he was given the impression that um, she was upset and kind of set the stage for that potential runaway that some of the police force actually did believe. So he has a, his shed prepared. He's got a tarp set up. He gets her into the shed and fully ties her up in there. And the whole time he is convincing her that this is about the ransom. She, as long as she's cooperative, he's gonna take care of business and she will be okay. So he leaves her and this is the point. Remember that crazy story that I could not make sense of that her boyfriend Dwayne told about the man, the masked man going in the truck. That actually happened. At this point, he uses MapQuest to find out where she lives. He goes to her truck and he does rifle through it to get her ID and uh, he is seen by her boyfriend. It was the ATM card that he got out of the truck. He already had her ID. It was the ATM card that he went back for. So just to re remind ourselves, this man is about to leave for a cruise with um, his daughter and his girlfriend's going to join him who's asleep at the house while this has all been going on. And so he gets the ATM card. She had already given him the code, which he scratched on the face of the card and he hits the ATM. And uh, they only have like 90 some cents or something. It was like less than $5 in their account. So of course he's denied. Um, and he says to the investigators, that ATM card is not the reason he took her. That was a bonus, I'm quoting him. Um, so he goes back to the house. And at this point, uh, they ask him if she was alive in the photos, the ransom photos that he sent. And he says, no, she was not. They ask if she was alive when he left and she was not when they left for the cruise um, by that point. But he doesn't want to disclose the rest of the story right now. He has some demands. So this is the beginning of um, the game and the control that goes on between Keys and the investigators. Uh, and he essentially tells them that he does not, he wants them to stop searching Kimberly's house, his girlfriend's house, which is the property that all this has happened on. They need to come to him and ask permission and he doesn't want them talking to her. He wants her left out of this right now. And uh, yeah, so I guess the, the mind games um, are now beginning. So Keys at this point says there's just too many of them in the room before he's gonna continue to talk about this story as well. Um, and it, you know, it, it really, it, it, the key investigators, um, we had talked about this, the weird situation with the prosecuting attorney leading this interrogation and being a part of it. And he would have been the obvious one to leave the room at this point, but he doesn't, he won't. I, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail on this video about what happened, but I'm gonna summarize it. Um, so he had, like I had mentioned, fully prepared the shed uh, for this event. And he had a space heater. He had some, I guess, heavy metal music playing loud. And he had her strung up and he, um, he raped her multiple times. He um, tortured her. Uh, at some point, his girlfriend Kimberly was awake. He would leave the house or leave the shed to go back to the house and talk to his girlfriend and come back out to the shed. Um, at one point, uh, his daughter actually came out to the shed for him and he was, she didn't come into the shed, uh, but she came out. 
so I, I, I'm, I'm still, my brain is just raveling. Um, but he, he kills her at this point. Um, and then he uh, has sex with her body. So he's got the shed very warm. Uh, it's like 90 degrees, he said, and he's playing the music. So by this point, um, he's been back and forth. He's spent a lot of time with her dead and alive. So he's got to go to the cruise. He's leaving with his daughter. Um, Kimberly's going to be meeting him for in a few days. Um, so he takes her body, he rolls it up in the tarp. Um, he's got a cabinet there and he stores it and then they go. So while he's on the cruise, he's checking the weather and it's, it's getting warmer in Alaska. So he knows when he gets back, he's going to have to um, take care of things. So when they are home, um, he removes her body from the cabinet. He has to thaw it out at this point because it's been in the um, cold weather. And this is where he takes the photos um, for the ransom demand. He picks up a typewriter. Um, he types the note. He says the misspellings are intentional. I, I, I don't know if I believe that or not. I, but um, he had trouble with the posing. I, I wanna I don't want to go into explicit detail um, on what this man did but I think it's important to understand the time and the patience the perseverance and the effort that he puts into this one task it I, I couldn't <laughs> he um, would he got her makeup and he had put it on her and he would take a photo and then he would look at the photo and say, nope, it's not right. It's not good enough. And he would do it, you know, do more and do more until he got to a place where he felt she looked alive. Um, he used hooks and um, thread or need, uh, some something to, because of the way her muscles um, had changed to um, bring them into a position that looked more lifelike. Um, he took multiple photos. He had picked up a Polaroid camera, which required him going to two different Walmarts. The first Walmart, he got the camera, but didn't have the film for it. So he had to wait, go to a, he had to wait and then go to another Walmart. At one point, guys, he stopped what he was doing and went to a parent-teacher conference for his daughter, um, who was being um, accepted into a, a gifted, talented program. And he had no he had no problem. He had absolutely no problem. He said because the investigators were like, "Wasn't that hard?" And he's like, "No, no." Um, I I I can't at this point. I I'm trying to wrap my head. The what he did. I want to stress this. What he did is crazy and unsettling. But the amount of effort, the fact that this man could pay such attention to detail and spend so much time to have created those photos is frightening because he's, he's beyond dangerous. Um, and so when he took all those photos, she, she was dead. And uh, he did some doctoring because um, there were some identifying moles and marks on his arm that he didn't want to come through. Uh, yeah. There are some inconsistencies as he's talking to the police over time because, you know, I, it, just to highlight that, at one point he said he didn't do this for the money, that was a bonus. And then later he says the bottom line was to get money out of it. Um, so the investigators is, this, are, is going on are, are noting these kinds of things. Um, and I, I don't think it's particularly unusual because I don't think that he's being fully honest. I think he's intentionally misleading just like in his conversation with people as he is with his activities. He knows how to plant evidence. Um, he, he, this man knows what he's doing. Uh, to get into things that are easier for me to talk about, um, just a little bit of context that we've learned about Keys at this point in time. He is a drinker. Um, his credit cards are maxed out. 
uh, his girlfriend Kimberly, I, I think the house is in her name, but she works, she is a professional as a nurse. Um, she takes care of the home. She's the one going to work consistently and making the reliable, the most reliable money. He says this construction work. Um, but it sounds like she's really the stable one um, in their relationship. They have a couple dogs that she takes care of. She doesn't, she's not very close to Key's daughter. She never really wanted children, um, but otherwise it sounds like um, she's very much, uh, you know, different um, in function than, than Key's is. So Samantha's body at this point is decomposing and starting to smell. So this is where um, he's held on to it for a while, her, it, her body. Um, and so he breaks it down um, and has to make three trips out to the lake. And he's, again, very thoughtful about the way he's, he does this. He purchases the sled. He gets the totes to transport the body, her body. Um, he uh, does it during daytime because he doesn't want to be out there at night and look suspicious. Uh, he uses like an, uh, a presentation of ice fishing. So he gets out there, he sets up his tent, he has to drill through the ice. Um, there's another ice, ma ice, ice man, <laughs> ice fisher um, out there who is kind of like watching him because the guy, what Keys is using, the tool, I forget what it is right now, but isn't getting the job done easily. And this man actually has like a really good ice drill. And I guess it's, he's like surprised Keys isn't asking for it. It's Keys' interpretation of the interaction. But regardless, again, another witness to what's going on. Um, so he sets everything up and it takes three trips, he said. So he packages up parts of her body. He weights them down. He comes to the hole, um, lets them go in. And uh, after his third and final um, deposit, he fishes. But you knew that one was coming. The other important piece too is that when he does this, like I said, he did it in the daytime, but he takes his phone apart. He removes the SIM card and removes the battery. So in a sense, he goes black um, when he's doing criminal activity. And I, I think that's important to keep in mind. So they now have a sense of where her body is. So now it's about the recovery. And they need specialists. They need people that can, um, it, it's Alaska, it's not a great time. Uh, so the diver they reach out to um, is a uh, last name. I think it's like Chacon. Ch Ch uh, I hope maybe mispronouncing it. Um, and this man uh, ha has a solid history, and he pulls his team together. What's really interesting, they know what they've learned just in talking about Keys. What we know about him so far is that he he's a master at leaving false clues clues and no forensic evidence. I'm going to tell you guys, this man is scary. Um, so they got the divers and that they get the divers out into the town. And at this point, the town knows um, the strangers, you know, that come in and they know they're on a recovery mission. Um, they set up their tents. Uh, they go in and they recover her um, they recover Samantha and it's really interesting I, I haven't read a lot about the the divers that do this kind of work but it makes the comment the book makes the comment that um, for a lot of FBI uh, investigators they may only see one dead body in the course of their career except the divers the divers are the people that they're always on recovery and they see um, body after body after body after body and um, a, a lot of them actually do suffer from PTSD and uh, yeah so it, it was it was interesting to read a little bit about the process um, when they go down into the water um, and the amount of effort it takes I think it was a 40 foot dive um, to the bottom and the weight of her body and um, in, in bringing it up so that is it. That is going to be it for this video. It's been a long one. Um, if you're reading along, we have now made it through part two. The next video will pick up with part three. And guys, I just want to say what blows my mind is this in and of itself is enough of a story. And then it hits me. Wait a minute. This man's a serial killer. And this is when he's caught. So this is actually the end of his 
his killing, but the beginning of the story, because we have barely scratched the surface. I don't know that I want to keep reading. Um, I do, I do, but I don't. It's so funny or not. Um, I'd love to hear if you guys are reading this book or just even in listening to it, you know, how you're reacting to the story. I mean, this guy is is creeping me out. And I remember when I heard people talking about reading this book when I was seeing it on social media, um, one person mentioned her husband had gone out of town when she decided to read this and how unsettling it is. And I read a lot of thrillers. I read a lot of horror. And it is the fact that this is true, I think, that makes it excessively, excessively, overwhelmingly unnerving. Um, it, it's, it, 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 it's having an impact, I think, on my mind. But thank you if you're, you made it through this whole video. Um, like I said, please, I, I'd love to talk to people about it. Comment away and uh, on to the next. Well, this one isn't happy reading. I don't know what to call this one right now, but uh, let's keep going.